In episode 81, In Search of Quantum Theory, we saw that there was no quantum theory. There was only a mathematical recipe. Following that recipe gives answers to certain questions to astounding accuracy. But if one asks about what the recipe means, what does it tell us about what is actually happening in the real world? To produce those answers, one might simply be told to shut up and calculate. So among physicists and their authoritative textbooks, one can find all sorts of quantum stories being believed by some and rejected by others. Some are convinced that Schrödinger's cat can be both dead and alive. Others believe that story was only concocted to ridicule Niels Bohr's Copenhagen interpretation. Some believe that particles like electrons can be in two places at once. Others tell us that their theory makes no such claim. How did this situation come about? Bjorn Eckerberg told us in episode 74, physicists led by Einstein declared that physics did not need philosophy. This means that to physicists, metaphysics, the acknowledgement that there must be something beyond materialism, is irrelevant. Free from philosophical interference, physicists became the sole arbiters of the value and truth of all their stories. And this was part and parcel of physicists banishing common sense from physics and replacing it with abstract mathematics, based on mathematical concepts rather than on the reality of the creation. This has led to much of physics becoming what Sabina Hossenfelder calls mathematical fiction. She pointed out that nobody can understand these people's papers, so nobody can criticise them. And that reflects back onto something she said when she quit the publish or perish treadmill. When I started studying at the university, my expectations were based on biographies of scientists. They wrote a lot of letters to each other. They went to conferences. They were thinkers and tinkerers and had sometimes heated but usually respectful arguments. This is what I expected. I'm not just telling you this because it's entertaining. It was also a rather rude awakening. It made me realize that this institute wasn't about knowledge discovery. It was about money making. And the more I saw of academia, the more I realized it wasn't just this particular institute and this particular professor. It was generally the case. The moment you put people into big institutions, the goal shifts from knowledge discovery to money making. The real problem is that the easiest way to grow in academia is to pay other people to produce papers on which you, as the grant holder, can put your name. That's how academia works. Grants pay students and postdocs to produce research papers for the grant holder. And those papers are what the supervisor then uses to apply for more grants. The result is a paper production machine in which students and postdocs are burned through to bring in money for the institution. Most of that money comes from your taxes. And I began to understand what you need to do to get a grant or get hired. You have to work on topics that are mainstream enough, but not too mainstream. You want them to be a little bit edgy, but not too edgy. No, it needs to be something that fits into the existing machinery. And since most grants are three years or five years at most, it also needs to be something that can be wrapped up quickly. The more I saw of this, the more I realized this wasn't how I wanted to spend my life. The other thing that happened was that the more I saw of the foundations of physics, the more I became convinced that most of the research there wasn't based on sound scientific principles. 
I just explained why thinking up new particles isn't a good strategy for progress in physics and why that had gotten an entire discipline stuck. And naive as I was, I expected physicists to think about it. I expected rational debate. But that never came. No one was interested. No one is interested. They were interested in writing more papers. And that's what they need all these particles and other wild ideas for, to write papers, to get grants, to get postdocs, to write more papers, and round and round it goes. She'd wanted to be a physicist because of the culture. Meetings of great minds discussing their thoughts and findings. But today, the culture is about money. Money from textbooks, money from research grants. Money from secure positions of being at the top of the sausage factory, publishing papers. Those exciting meetings of the minds don't happen today. But some physicists realised that physics lost its way when it threw out common sense for abstract mathematics. That's why it's in the mess that Sabina keeps talking about. So some physicists have turned back to philosophy and reason, instead of just mathematics. We met Thomas Kuhn in episode 77. He was close to submitting a PhD thesis on theoretical physics when his eyes were opened. He dropped his thesis and turned all of his attention to the history and philosophy of science. That had quite an effect on some other scientists. We met Tim Maudlin in episode 81, Richard Milton in episode 80, and Bjorn Eckerberg in episode 74. They all make strong cases against the poverty of the current status quo. Kurt Jaimungel has been doing a brilliant job of introducing us to a wide range of top scientists in his Theories of Everything videos. He recently took part in a very unusual meeting at Harvard. Scientists and students were invited to a forum where two scientists, well known for their research, would be open to interaction. Much of the discussion centred around Jacob Barendius, a physicist who had turned to philosophy of physics for insights into the quagmire of the quantum. In John Bell's second version of his famous Bell theorem, 1975 paper, The Theory of Local Beables, is what it was called, it's, it's the term Beables, he tried to find a version, a, a, a way to formulate this non-locality in quantum theory that showed that it was causally non-local, that there was causal influences propagating instantaneously, but without relying on agents and interveners. He tried very hard to do it, and arguably he did not succeed. So it does look on the surface like some non-local cause, cause, causal factor is happening, but if you try to phrase it in terms of the atoms without a good, like robust theory of causal influence, it's very hard to say that's happening. Bell tried to do it, but arguably he was unsuccessful. Okay, last chance for questions. People who have not spoken to me, so. The model was probably part of this, this stuff when we were, you know, 22 year olds or 20 year olds inspired by, by learning just a scratch more than high school physics. And I'm struck looking back, you know, 30 years since, 35 years since, how you're still, I mean, just then you're quoting a 1975 book, right? Can you give us a flavor of, of what's happened in the last 50 years? And I wonder if you're just not saying much because we're not, I don't know. We're not ready. We're, we're not worthy. To, to get it. I mean, that, would be, <laughs> that would be a theory. Uh, but, but if you could, like, what, what's at, are we really that frozen that we're still talking about these 150-year-old theories as, as if they're the stick of the art? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I needed to know. Well, Jacob, you wrote your paper. Yeah, you're up with it. Yeah, yeah you're on. I, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to slightly expand on that just a little bit and just say this. This thing that we're doing here, this thing that... The decoherence. No, this thing that you, 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 are, you, are, you have brought into being, this intellectual exchange... This discourse that we're engaging in right now, this, this intellectual like engagement that we're experiencing right now, there is so little of this in physics right now. 
Uh, you you, you may think, friends, well, I'm in a physics department. Friends. We must all sit around in a physics department and, and talk like this and talk about what's going on. We do not. Well, it's because like, we're all amateurs. This is like people, right? <laughs> no, like this people. does not happen in physics departments. Yes. That does happen in philosophy departments. It does not happen in physics departments. Okay? Why does it happen in physics departments? <laughs> Complicated historical reasons. Now, in the early, the first half of the 20th century, right? You look at the, at the great physicists in the early 20th That's, century. That was happening. Right. That was happening all the time. Yeah. Right. They were deeply engaged with philosophers. They were deeply engaged with the Vienna Circle and the, and the positivists. And they were reading Karl Popper and they were arguing about Schopenhauer. And they were arguing about, they were all claiming on all sides of the debates about quantum theory that they were the, the true vicars of Kant and Kantian philosophy. All of them were doing that, right? And then something shifted in the intellectual environment in physics. And the best I can say is it was the war. It was the shift of physics to America, and it was also money, okay? When there's a lot of money at stake, people suddenly feel like they're in a huge hurry to get concrete practical results. There's no time to sit around and talk about philosophy. I find it very significant that Berendes points to the very thing that Sabina Hossenfelder so much wanted to find in physics. The challenging interaction of ideas and argument that was once a part of the excitement that was physics. Berendes points out that all of the pioneer physicists were deeply read philosophers, skilled in argumentation, and he gives three reasons for the demise of this culture. The Second World War. The countries where all the progress had been made were bombed and in ruins the move to America as the centre of scientific research. Among the pioneer scientists, there was the desire to find out what physics could actually mean in terms of the real world. But the new buzzword in America was shut up and calculate. And, of course, there was the rise of the centrality of money. The new paradigm of publish or perish. Papers had to be written and published and quotas had to be met. And a whole new generation had been brought up with the worldview that physics didn't need philosophy and common sense must be replaced by abstract mathematics. And one thing that really highlights the stagnation in physics Stagnation which Sabina keeps pointing to. Stagnation which Greg Chaitin pointed to in episode 111. One of the scientists at the Harvard Forum pointed out that there seemed to be nothing new in quantum mechanics since about 50 years ago. Berendes was asked if quantum mechanics had anything newer than that. There are people like himself trying to tweak things here and there. But real advances? No. But I think we can be cautiously optimistic about what we've just been looking at. Kurt Jaimungel is doing a good job of getting scientists to explain their ideas on video and getting other scientists to discuss and critique them. And if getting back to open discussion like this can again become part of physics, we may see more questions like this one. But one of the questions that I have is, like, does it matter that we exist? In other words, if you look at the whole biomass of the universe, the Earth is insignificant, and humans within it are, you know, even more so. But if you look at the amount of consciousness or the amount of theorems or the amount of, I don't know, heartbreaks in the universe, then we play a very big role, at least in my view. And what's really interesting is that at the heart of quantum physics lies an observer. Some would say. Some would say. Some would say. So basically what I, what I want to ask you is, does it matter to the universe that we are here? <laughs> does it matter that we're here? So, um, <laughs> 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 and 
And if you do think about things like this, you can't avoid confronting the possibilities that it points to. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.